Yeah, I think I think we need a few more letters in our um, business name. Cool. So, thanks very much for for having us here today. Um, really excited to be speaking to you on the topic of magic. I wanted to share with you before we start. Can you guys all hear us? By the way, yeah, good. So, I wanted to share with you this morning just a story that I came across this week. Um, it was on TechCrunch. TechCrunch, uh, you may be aware of, is a leading sort of technology site. And they've got a conference on called TechCrunch Disrupt. And part of TechCrunch Disrupt is that a whole bunch of startups go and pitch their ideas with the idea being that the best ones get funding. But there was one startup that caught the attention uh, of myself. And it's called Lovebot. Just let that sink in for a moment. Lovebot. I didn't know where this was going, but I think the headline of the article captures it. And I don't know if you can read it out the back, but it says, Lovebot tells your wife you love her, so you don't have to. <laughs> this is the calibre of ideas that are being pitched to global audiences. I also like the intro line which says, Lovebot is the thoughtful husband or wife that you aren't. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's like the, the trademark you know, tagline for the brand or whatnot, but it made me just question, what is it that we're doing today? Like, that we think that, hey, this is an unreal service for people out, out there. I'm not sure about this guy if um, he's going to be married at the end of the day. But I find this story out because today the, I want to talk to you about uh, magic in the context of designing products and services. And specifically designing products and services in an age where machines and algorithms and artificial intelligence are basically supplying that technology and that framework to um, provide it. So that whole Lovebot thing, that's all based um, on, on AI, artificial intelligence, using uh, different techniques like natural language processing to help have that interaction. So it sends off text messages that are pre-written to your loved one. Hey, I love you. How's your day going? Bizarre. Very bizarre. But I wanted to talk about how do we create these moments of magic in a world that is increasingly automated? in a world that is you know, highly predictive and personalised. And I think that the challenge for us is, you know, how might we create and craft, design magical experiences in a world that is run by machines? You know, if, if everything's automated, if everything's collecting data on every interaction, on all your behaviours, all your preferences, what does that really look like? So today I want to look at some tips for designing in this age. But I thought I'd start off with just talking to you about what is this age that we live in? What is this technology that's really driving a lot of the developments in product? And that is artificial intelligence. So the world's leading companies are using AI to really drive a number of, of new avenues in the way that people experience their product and services. Baidu CEO, which is a leading internet company from China, says that the next growth driver of the internet is AI. Sundar Bakai, who's the CEO of Google, says that we're going to move from a mobile first world to an AI first world. And that's some pretty big statements. And we're seeing the likes of Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and a whole bunch of others, the people, the companies of, of products that you use pretty much on a daily basis, use AI as that central technology enabler of their products and services. So what is AI? AI is human intelligence exhibited by machines. I want to just break it down for you today because it is a bit of a complex topic, but to show you what is AI. And there's three forms of it. So the first is artificial narrow intelligence. And this is an AI that is specific to a singular task or activity, as good or even better than you or I could do it. And today we often find that these specific AI narrow tasks are combined together to develop a, a more coherent solution. So if you've got an iPhone today, you've probably already experienced it if you've ever used Siri. When you talk um, to Siri, if she listens to you, um, it uses voice recognition. It takes what you're saying, takes that audio, breaks it down to text. Then it uses another AI technique called natural language processing, it takes that text, understands what all those words mean, 
in the context that's been said and then goes and fulfills that task. If you've ever swiped to the right on your phone and you've seen here's series like recommended apps or people, that's all done through a technique called machine learning. These are just the, the kinds of narrow intelligence um, techniques that are being used to develop the products and experiences today. The second form of AI is called artificial general intelligence. This is often referred to as strong or human level AI and it describes an AI that's as smart as us across the board. It can reason, it can understand like emotional intelligence, it can be a bit more creative. It's, it's much more like you and I. And if it helps, think of C-3PO in Star Wars. And if you haven't seen Star Wars, then recommend that for the weekend. But <laughs> C-3PO is like a, a nice mental model to understand what does that general intelligence look like. You know, you can kind of interact with it. You under, he understands what, what's going on. Not completely there, but there enough that, you know, it feels like you're interfacing and interacting with a human. And the last form of AI is artificial superintelligence. And this is the most advanced form of AI. And one of the leading thinkers around this is Nick Bostrom. And he, he says this about uh, ASI. It's an intellect that is much smarter than the best human brains in practically every field. But we're very, very far off this type of AI. But it's this type of artificial intelligence that grabs the headlines. This is where you hear Terminator, Skynet, robots taking over the world. Elon Musk says that we're summoning the demon. I mean, these make for great headlines. And it's easy to see why, you know, there's so much media hype around it. But the fact is that that narrative is just so far off what we can do with it today. It's a large distraction from how you and I can use these techniques in our products and services to create moments of magic, to, to meet needs that haven't been met in a new and exciting way. So like I said, most of these products that we, that we use today have AI in it. And again, I'm not sure if you can see, but what we've got here is an example of a product called Google Allo, which is one of Google's messaging services that you've probably never ever heard of because their messaging services never really take off. But what they've done is they've used a number of different narrow intelligence techniques to deliver this experience. So on the left in this iPhone, as you're conversing with, with someone, up comes a photo. And what, what happens is that there's an image recognition that goes on. It understands that that photo is a person holding a flower. But it doesn't understand that it's just a person holding a flower. It realizes that it's a child and it's actually holding a daisy. And so when it understands that, it surfaces up a whole bunch of recommended uh, replies, like suggested, uh, suggested replies in, in Google Inbox, so that you can start to re reply back. The other, the other example is one where you're talking with your friend and you're like, hey, I want to go out tonight. And in comes Google Assistant, which is their form of, Google Siri, uh, of Siri. And what it does is it understands what's been happening in the conversation. It says, hey, I want to go out for dinner tonight. When I go out in Surrey Hills. So it brings up a whole bunch of restaurants and, and cafes and bars for, for Surrey Hills. It goes, which one do you like? Oh, I like this one. Do you want to book it? Yeah, sure. What time? Seven. Boom. Off, done. And that's a great example of just how AI can transform an experience. That's, it's a really nice use case. It's removed a whole bunch of friction points that normally we would have had. Whenever you, you're talking with people to go out for dinner, you, you would have left that app. You would have opened up you know, Safari or Chrome, and you start to, you might go to Broadsheet, you might go to another, another site to look at, you know, where are the cafes or the, the bars that I should go to tonight? I'm going to waste a whole bunch of time looking it up, looking them up. Then I'll go back to my Messenger app, and I'll say, hey, I found these ones. Oh, let me go and find, have a look at them too, um, because I can't see what you're seeing. And there's just this frustration after frustration, pain point after pain point around just trying to book a place to go eat with your friend. And here we see AI being used to deliver really nice moment of magic, a moment of delight. But I think whilst that's great, it also poses us a number of problems and challenges as designers. How do we create moments of magic and delight for our, for our users and for our, our customers if, if everything is personalized? 
if everything is predictive, if everything is really tailored. And today I want to explore what that looks like and give you some, just some tips and thoughts around how I think we should be designing in this world where everything is increasingly automated. And the first one is work your magic. You need a knife? <laughs> no, you don't. So AI is limited. It's, it's great at tasks that humans find hard and not so great at tasks that humans find easy. It can understand the what, but doesn't really understand the why. It's really good at drawing correlations from data and understanding, well, what does this mean? But doesn't understand the causation. And really today, AI and, and this new technology, it lacks our magic skills, it lacks our core skills, which is, which is empathy, emotion, understanding people, creativity, and this is our magic, and we need to bring this when we're designing products and services. And we use this best when we're talking with, with customers, when we're talking with our users. So we need to uncover ways where we can add magic, can add moments of delight by understanding from a consumer's point of view, where is that best placed? Where are your frustrations? What are you trying to achieve? Where is that service letting you down? Why is that important to you? Why? Why, 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 why? The more that we ask that from a place of empathy and from a, a position of how I want to help you achieve your outcome, the better off our solutions are going to be. The better off your product will be. The, the greater chance of creating that moment of magic, that moment of delight, is much higher when we have that. Because without it, without understanding the, the problem, then we risk developing a, a solution that has no problem. We risk developing Lovebot. I don't know how big that market is, but it must be declining. You know, we risk developing solutions without problems. Well, we risk not understanding the, the true problem. Delighted elements, moments of magic in products and services, they come about when we understand what a customer wants. So let's use our magic. The second tip is to embrace AI, embrace this new technology, but understand our role. And I think our role in this next wave of uh, product design and interaction is to make things more human to bring that human element to products and services, we need to look for ways to augment the technology. And there's two things that really stand out for me. There's one that is around managing the creep factor and building trust. And the second one is, as designers, that we need to consider the trade-offs when solving these frictions. So I wanna just sort of unpack those two little things. So for me, this is really a case of art and science. You have this great technology, but without understanding people and understanding their motivations, their behaviours, their habits, and their desires, what are they wanting to do, then we, we risk the chance of just clashing it together. But when we balance those two, we can de develop greater solutions. And in a world where we're using so much data to personalise things, I think data actually represents the greatest opportunity to build trust with the user. So that level of insight that you generate, it should be relative to their, their permission level. What I, what I mean by that is that you don't want to be in a position where a user has received, hey, we recommend you check out this, or we saw you did this, and here's our recommendation, or here's a personalized whatever, and then go, what the heck? How did you get that information? Have you been stalking me around the internet? You don't want to be in that, that position. And so we need to be really careful around how we manage users' data. And that might be just, hey, we need to tell you how we're going to use your data. We want to tell you why we're collecting your data. And there's clever ways that we can go about that. It could be just through the language and the interface saying, hey, we're going to do this and this is what we're going to recommend. And we can balance sort of inferred data, data that says, hey, we, you know we're going to watch you as you use our product. We know that you have a preference to do this or click on that. That's fine, but when it comes to like pulling in other data sources, we really run the risk that you know, we're going to erode that trust element. And that's where we need to be really mindful of to help users understand their data, how their data is being used. 
The second thing is just considering the trade-offs when solving frictions. I think we can lose the magic if algorithms do everything, if everything is automated. We can miss moments of, of creating magic. I was reading this story from uh, about a digital agency in New York who's using the coffee shop downstairs as a bit of a, a lab to test all their ideas around retail and consumer experience. And they developed this product that they said was streamlining the whole coffee, the whole coffee purchasing, coffee drinking experience. It's removing all the pain points, solving all the, the points of friction. And what they'd done is that they'd work with the, the coffee shop and their employees so that the coffee shop and the barista would know when you're approaching. It's not beat the queue and you actually letting them know, hey, I'm on my way, can you make my coffee? This is completely predictive. It's not initiated by the user. They just know that you're coming. I don't know how they do it, like maybe it's geofenced and that you know as you hit a certain mark it triggers something. I'm not sure, but as you're approaching, the barista just starts making your coffee. He knows, hey, yep, here comes Chris, he wants a strong flat white, and boom, there it is. And I walk past, pick it up, and I just keep going on my way to work. And I, they were heralding it as like, this is the future of getting your coffee. And I thought, well, that's nice, but kind of defeats the point of even just that coffee, getting the coffee experience. I mean, getting a coffee is, you know, the white collar smoker break. We, you go out to get a coffee to waste some time. I don't want to go back into work. <laughs> like, I don't smoke, but I'll have a coffee. You know, I go out there to talk with friends. I don't want it to be streamlined like and mechanical and just, oh, Chris is here, here's your coffee. Oh, I didn't want to go back. That's only one minute outside of the office. I need to at least you know, push this out to five minutes. If everything becomes automated and, and really predictive and mechanical like that, we, we can miss moments to provide magic, serendipitous moments. You know, you, you might miss a conversation with a friend. You might miss a conversation with a complete stranger or just talking with the barista. You know, how many people here have a favorite coffee shop and the, the barista knows your name? They've already got that you know, AI built into them. They're like, oh yeah, here comes Chris, he wants this. But I can have a conversation with him. And when I think of that and I think of Lovebot and a whole bunch of other things that are just becoming really predictive, I think we run the risk that removing the friction actually creates this really monotonous and mundane experience for us. I like the way that Spotify tackles this kind of pro problem in which they augment the machine, they augment technology with man. And they do this in their playlists. So they've got a whole bunch of playlists that are completely automated, they're completely personalized. It looks at everything that you're listening to, scans that, and then delivers it. But they've got a bunch of playlists that actually go, here's what the data is telling us about you. This is, we know what you like, but we're also gonna mix that with someone from our office that can add a bit of, bit of flavor to it. And I love what one of their product managers says, that the point is not a personalized playlist that's perfect every time. It's supposed to challenge you a little bit. And I love that. I love that, yes, you could develop a solution that removes all the friction points, but in fact, they're designing in these little points of friction. They're designing in moments to make you a bit uncomfortable. So it isn't mundane. So it can actually cause a potential moment of delight. Oh, I've never heard that band before. And now I go down that, that rabbit hole and, oh, this is my new favorite brand. Have you heard them? You know, it, it opens it up for those kinds of experiences. So as designers, we need to consider the trade-offs in designing experiences, product services that eliminate all the friction points. How might we design experiences that remove key frictions, help people to get the job done better, but invite and design in new frictions, those that challenge our beliefs, those that put us out of our comfort zone, that cause us to self-reflect, that cause us to discover something new. And I think as we move into this world where everything is becoming more automated, driven by AI, designers role, build trust with users, let them know how we're using your data, but consider the trade-offs that all these 
great benefits of this technology bring and what we could actually lose as a result. The third and final tip and thought for designing this age is find more magic tricks. Magic. <laughs> I love gifts. You might have heard of this guy before. He got a bit of a plug because of a Telstra commercial, but he's a science fiction writer and futurist, and his, his name is Arthur C. Clarke. And he's got three laws. No one really knows the other two, but the first one... The first one's related to scientists, and if you're an old scientist and he says that we can do something, then you most likely can do it. But if the old scientist says that you can't do something, he's probably definitely wrong. The second one, was, which I even like sometimes more than the third, is the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. Like, yeah, that's nice. I like that. But it's the third one here today that I want to talk to you which is any, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And what he means by that is that the latest technology can provide products and solutions that to the general public, to people outside of this, this kind of room, it just appears as magic. They know that it's technology driving the whole thing. They're not idiots. But it's so far beyond like... I can't compute this, that it's just magic. Even the, the humble microwave. Just open the door, put in something, press a button, ding, it's boiling hot. How the heck does that happen? Wi-Fi, magic. I still don't know how that thing works. And I work in digital. I'm just like, man, Wi-Fi. Phew, internet everywhere. That's magic. Being able, to, being able to go to an ATM these days without a wallet and just get cash out through an app, through your phone. That's magic. I don't know how that works. Well, I kind of do, but... <laughs> to the general public, they don't, know how, they don't have a clue how that works. All they know is that's friggin' awesome. There's one less thing to carry in my pocket. Requesting an Uber, pressing a button, and all of a sudden a taxi just pulling up right in front of you. That's magic. Even Travis Kalanick, the CEO, called, it says that he wants to make that experience like magic. He understands that we need to create these moments of delight. I don't know if I wanted to go there, but I was going to say Pokemon Go. <laughs> Pokemon Go was magic for many reasons. One, it was magic to watch fully grown men and women run around like a bunch of crazy people chasing invisible creatures. But it opened up this magic world to a number of different people. Augmented reality. No one, no, people don't even know that that's like the term used for it. All they know is there's something friggin' awesome happening on my screen and as I run around, like, there's stuff happening. These are all magic moments, magic experiences that new technology can bring us. But the downside of this, the flip side of this, is that magic can decay. Magic can decay. There's a... There was a Japanese researcher and consultant called Noriaki Kano who proposed a set of techniques and uh, ideas that would help us to determine the customer satisfaction level with designing product features and designing a product. It's called the Kano model. You may have heard of it. And basically what it does is it splits up product features into four key categories. The first one is must-haves. To, the, to satisfy the customer, you have to have these. These are just table stakes. If you don't get these right, just don't even ship your product. Don't even put it out there because you're not going to make anyone happy. The second is indifferent features. These are more often than not the features that we come up with that we think are like amazing and you go and test them with the customer and they go, yeah, that sucks. Get rid of them. The third is performance features, things that help them get the job done better and you improve them over time. So like the, the lens in your camera, getting a better lens, now it's more megapixels, it's this performance feature that keeps growing, it satisfies you, it's not, oh, this is amazing, but it's, I'm glad that it's getting better. And then there's delighter features, that's the fourth. And delighter features are those elements of a product and a service that bring delight that bring these moments of magic, that address unmet needs in a new way or in a way that they just never thought of. And they go, this is awesome. I'm going to tell my friends about this. 
And these are delighted features. But what the model proposes is that these delighted features, that these features that are the bee's knees, end up decaying over time. Delighters, they turn into performance features. Performance features turn into table stakes. And so as designers, we must be constantly looking for ways to continually add more magic. And we, we do that by talking with our customers. We do that by talking with our users. We've got to be constantly looking for ways to bring in magic. It goes back to that first point. We've got to do this from this place of empathy, understanding what is it that you're wanting to get done? How can we design a better experience to bring in more delight, bring in moments of magic for you? AI, while it might be able to develop a personalized playlist, might be able to tell you, hey, this is the reply or this is the message that you should send to your wife. It doesn't tell you what a delight of feature is. It doesn't tell you what is table stakes. That's what you need to do. That's what us as designers and creatives need to find out. That's our role. And if we fail to move with the needs and the goals of our consumers, then it doesn't matter how good the technology is. It doesn't matter how good the execution is, how good the interface looks. It doesn't matter because you just haven't hit the basic 101s. You haven't created a product or service that meets the needs of a customer, that meets the needs of the, of the user. I'm excited about technology. I'm excited about artificial intelligence and all the different attributes that it brings and the way that it can enhance our products and experiences. But we've got to understand those, those three points. You've got to bring our magic. You've got to work your magic skills, empathy, understanding where a person's coming from. What are they trying to achieve? Understand our role as designers to augment that tech, to help and try and build trust, to consider the trade-offs that, that come about when we remove all the frictions in an automated world. How do we design in new frictions to bring moments of delight, to push people out of their comfort zone in a good way? And that we've got to constantly look to bring magic to our users. We've got to be constantly talking. It's not set and forget. It's a repetitive cycle. And they're the three things that I think that we as designers and creatives need to think about if we want to create moments of magic in our products and services. Thank you.